Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Arctic Summer College. My name is Max Grunig from the Ecologic Institute and this week's session is on social impacts of the changing Arctic and um, that's for this week and next week and so we're starting our last module for this year. I'm very excited. We have two experienced speakers here with us who have also both already spoken for past year's Arctic Summer Colleges. And uh, our first speaker tonight here, or this morning, depending on which time zone you are in, is Janni Staffanson. Uh, she's an advisor uh, with the, the Arctic Environmental Unit at the Sami Council. Uh, she was born uh, in a reindeer herding family in the southernmost part of Sami. And um, she is not only has she a degree in chemistry uh, and also uh, a master's thesis in organic chemistry, she has been working with the Sami Council within the Arctic Council in the uh, Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program and on other Arctic Council related issues. And she was elected to be on the Arctic Focal Point within the International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change and worked in the technical team within this uh, forum. And she also negotiated as part of the UNFCCC meetings. And finally, during the convention of the parties COP21 in Paris. Uh, since 2016, she has served as the indigenous representative on the Arctic Science Summit steering committee. And uh, today, that she's here with us. And I want to add one small caveat. Uh, her uh, webcam is not uh, fully working today, so she will not be visible to you, but you will be able to hear her. So, and, and her screen sharing works as well. So this essential aspects are there. And uh, Yanni, if, if you can, um, um, you're good to go. Uh, we won't see you much, but uh, I will, of course, be there. I'll disappear now for a minute so that there's no confusion about who's presenting. I'll come back then later for the group discussion. And as always, you're more than welcome to ask questions after the presentation, and uh, we'll take all your questions if time permits. Thank you, Yanni, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much and um, good day, I'd say, to everyone. Um, I am very happy to have been invited to be one of the speakers today. Uh, I'm sorry that I am not able to share my screen with you or my, um, my camera with you, but I, I do have my screen, so I, um, I hope that's enough. Um, my name is Janis Stefansson, uh, as said and I work for uh, the Sami Council. Um, I will tell you today somewhat about my work and the Sami Council's work um, and, the, and some, some bit about the Sami people and our worldview. Um, and then I will go more into the, uh, the impacts and the different stressors that are affecting uh, the climate and the social impacts in the um, aspects in the Arctic, uh, both in people, but the entire ecosystems of animals and uh, all our surroundings. Um, I would also want to touch a bit about this, uh, some of the solutions that I think we need to, or we could uh, look into, and that would be um, maybe in a more holistic way, uh, but I hope that um, I hope that you will be able to to uh, follow me within this trip. It will be um, quite much information in a very short, limited time. Uh, so I hope that we will have time for for good questions as well. Um, so the Sami Council, uh, we are an NGO. That's an organization. Um, created in 56, which we are quite an old uh, organization and one of the oldest indigenous peoples organization. Um, the Sami Council is an umbrella organization, which means that we have um, 
member organizations, um, Sami organizations in all countries that Sami are living, uh, which is northern Sweden, Finland, uh, Norway, and Russia. Um, we are a quite diverse organization. We work with a lot of people uh, issues, human rights issues, but also environmental rights. Uh, we work with in uh, self-determination issues. Um, and we're now building an EU uh, unit uh, that will work more towards the towards the EU since we have um, we have Samis living in both Finland and uh, Sweden, which is a part of EU. Um, we also work a lot with culture and language. Um, and um, some of the things that we have been working with in the past and we are very proud of is uh, that the Sami Council have been uh, in the process of creating the, uh, when the um, UN Declaration of Indigenous Peoples' Rights were negotiated and adapted in 2007. Um, but also we have been part of um, the negotiation and process of um, the ILO Convention 169, which deals with uh, Sami uh, and indigenous peoples issues. Um, and since 20 years now, we have been working together with the Nordic states in the Nordic Sami Convention, which is supposed to be a convention um, of rights and uh, between Samis um, and the states, um, but I, we haven't really gotten to any good, good progress there so far. Um, so that's a continuous work. But all I can say that um, the changed climate that we do see uh, in the Arctic today is affecting all of these areas. Um, so in order for you to fully understand that, I, uh, the easiest way for me to describe it is to take you with me on a road of, of more about me and where, I, where I'm from and how my worldview is, uh, how I was brought up and, and why I do this. Um, as was presented, my, my family is a reindeer herders and uh, so am I. Um, I was brought up very closely to the nature and uh, my father taught me to always put the reindeers in the first, the first room, uh, to always keep the reindeers safe and happy and the reindeers uh, will always be first prioritized. And if the reindeers are safe and happy, we will be safe and happy and all else will, uh, all other issues will, will come together. Uh, in a good way and if you keep the, the reindeer safe and happy. Um, and that is my driving force. And I also, as I said, have a background in chemistry because I, I do, um, I'm interested in the nature and I do want to know more of how it all fits together. Uh, and the knowledge that I have from my upbringing is talking a lot about that, but it's also talk, it doesn't, go down to the chemistry of it always. Um, so that's why I, I'm interested in the chemistry part. Um, and my work today is uh, mostly for the Sami Council, but also in the Arctic Council. Uh, and the Arctic Council is a council made out uh, of the eight Arctic states together with six indigenous peoples organization. And they deal with a lot of diverse issues uh, social issues, but uh, also natural sciences issues and policy issues, cooperation issues and such things. Language is also one of them. But the, one of the working groups that I'm involved in uh, is dealing with monitoring and assessments in the Arctic, uh, which kind of combines all of the, uh, the science and the, the data we have from, uh, from studies in all of the states and then we put them together to make an Arctic specific um, assessment. And we do that, for example, with um, areas as um, adaptation, as snow and water, uh, as with methane and black carbon, um, as in short lived climate forces, and also resilience in the Arctic and all the Arctic ecosystems. 
Um, and there we work together, indigenous peoples experts, uh, together with the, the experts from the states. Um, and it leads up until recommendations and advices that the uh, ministers, the foreign affairs ministers, um, could adapt and have a declaration about if they so wishes um, after the release of the assessments and so on and so on. Um, and I, I like to work in the Arctic Council because it is a good way of combining uh, what I call the Western science and the science of the indigenous peoples, which uh, are referred to often as indigenous knowledge or um, traditional knowledge. Um, and I think that, or I'm, I'm positive that without having these two knowledge systems combined, uh, we will not fully um, see what's going to come when, when we have a increase in the climate change. Um, and we will have a better, we will have a better um, chance of actually succeeding to have some kind of predictions if we combine all of the sciences and if we put on the table the best available knowledge and make our decisions out of that and our um, models um, of, of that. Um, I'm convinced that, yes, we have to have the science that is Western science as well. It's, uh, it's well earned and it um, obtains a lot of interesting knowledge, but we also do need to be on the land to see the land, to live off the land and be a part of the land and the ecosystem in order to obtain what we what we call the indigenous knowledge and the indigenous knowledge is as valid as science it's inherited by being on the land by by watching the nature by being observant and you are constantly challenged by being observant um, when you are living on the land and when you are dependent on the land um, I wanted to tell you somewhat about the Sami people. We are uh, one of the indigenous peoples uh, in, in the northern part of Scandinavia. This is the area we call uh, Sápmi. It's the areas where, where we are living with the reindeers and migrating with the reindeers. And it continues up until Russia. I'm sorry that I were not able to find a good um, screen with the Russian side as well. But in the northeastern part of Russia is also Sápmi. Um, <clears throat> I was born in an area down here, uh, and I now live here. Uh, it's a very long distance. It's it's a country in between those distances. But I have my reindeers in the south, and I now live with my family's reindeers in the north. Um, the Sami people are. Traditionally, reindeer herders, uh, hunters, gatherers, uh, fishermen, handcrafters, musicians. Um, but we are also doctors. We are also teachers. We're uh, we're workers in every, your everyday life. And there's not many of us that are living um, in those traditional lifestyles anymore. And it's depending on different uh, things things that I might um, that I might try to explain to you and you might try you might understand after this session um, but the Sami people we live by a worldview uh, as many other indigenous peoples that you uh, you do not own land um, you share it and you borrow it and you give back to the land um, and you give give to all of the ecosystems. You help animals and plants and and others that needs help uh, with food or with the growing or with uh, seedlings and such, or as in our case uh, with reindeer herding. So we follow the reindeers. My family follow with the reindeers, and um, we have been migrating with the reindeers through time, um, and they sustain us and we sustain them through a sacred relationship uh, and um, and one of the fundamental part of the indigenous worldview is that um, you take and you give back and you leave no traces 
uh, and only then are you respecting the nature um, fully. Um, I'm going to go into some, some stressors um, that are affecting the, uh, the, well, that have social impacts in the, in the humans, but also on the animals and on the ecosystems. Both that we have um, stressors that are from climate change, but also stressors that are from other um, issues, but also from uh, stressors that are from the same source that why why we have climate change or a changed climate. Um, and this is what we call the uh, cumulative effects. When you combine all of these stressors and then you fully understand what's, what is the issue and you can, uh, can get closer to the issue. Um, so some of the stressors that uh, the Sami are experiencing today uh, are both new and old historical stressors but are still um, affecting our everyday life. Uh, for example, mining. Uh, his Sweden uh, and the Scandinavian countries have had a long history of minings and they, we are continuously opening new mines and we have a huge pressure uh, on our land with new mining companies wanting to come into our land to, to extract um, metals and many of the um, many of the Samis have been forced to move and many of the reindeers have been forced to give up, uh, up their land for mining or for the infrastructure that uh, the mines demands or the ways that they um, are polluting the nature with uh, and a lot of the mining companies have uh, not the economy to to clean up the uh, the pollution that they are leaving so that's also an issue and that's land that's destructed um, we also have had this year forest fires for example a lot of the uh, the pasture from for the reindeers have been um, destroyed in in the huge uh, fires that we have had this summer um, forest fires also uh, forces other uh, animals into new areas for example, a lot of the forest fires have been in, uh, in areas where a lot of predators have been living and now the predators are forced to find new areas. So all the animals have to um, have, have smaller areas to actually move and live off um, now. Uh, SAP may have also had a long history of how hydropower extraction. It started in the, in nine, uh, in the beginning of the 1900s and um, was quite hard on the river system in Sweden and in Sápmi. Um, we are still living with these, um, these hydropower plants and the effects that they have. Um, they are regulating the rivers, so during the winter time it's, uh, it's dangerous to travel on those river systems. Uh, and those river systems used to be our um, our migration uh, pathways. Um, so that's a, that's a difficulty we have. And a lot of the reindeers have been migrating uh, over rivers uh, that are no longer, or that are um, today, huge lakes instead of rivers. A lot of pasture was lost, but also um, it's a trauma in our history uh, and a lot of um, people, the older people, they still remember um, how being forced and they also, um, they have these stories of, uh, of the grief of losing your homeland and losing the land that you love and that you have lived off of. Because um, that's also one of the, uh, the strong thing with indigenous peoples that we are so connected to our land. And when we lose that land, that is a trauma for generations to come. Um, today we also have a, uh, a demand of energy uh, and Sweden is a country that really wants to move off of fossil fuel which is something I applaud and I um, stand with Sweden in that decision and the governments and all who wants to change from fossil fuel which is something we, we need that change and electricity is a good um, alternative. Um, but we do need to do that in a just way. 
and in a way that is sustainable and in a way that is not violating other uh, human rights or indigenous people's rights. Um, we need to do that in a just way and I will come back to that in, in the later part of the... Um, we also have, as I said, a lot of predators in, in, the, in the area, which is um, a dreadful thing to have in your herd. When you love your herd, it's difficult to, to work with different predators and, and it's, um, it's mental, mentally difficult to, to see a, a wounded reindeer that you love a lot or that they have been killed or um, that they are stressed because there is a predator close by so they, they won't eat and they will just uh, continue to move. Um, we have a, an increase in infrastructure more roads are built on the reindeer's land and fragmenting the land. Uh, a lot of more railroads are built on, on in Zahmi, which is also a good thing, but um, it is um, uh, causing a lot of deaths for the reindeers. Um, and that is an issue as well. We have a permafrost thaw in some areas um, that might be become an issue all over it's an increasing issue in the Arctic. Um, we have deforestation issues where a lot of, um, uh, where it's also a historical industry in, in the Scandinavian country of chopping down a lot of forests. And the reindeers, they eat lichen on the, in the winter time um, from the trees and from the ground. And lichen takes quite a long time to, to grow. Uh, for example, those areas that have had forest fires, it takes about eight years to regrow lichen. And um, those lichen, them, they, they grow in forests that are old. Uh, so old forests have a lot of, of that food. Uh, new forests do not. And today Sweden is still chopping down those old forests. Uh, which the reindeers are depending on. Uh, a lot of uh, biodiversity is within those old forests. Uh, so that's a huge loss and sorrow that that, that kind of um, deforestation is still allowed in, in, in Sweden today. Um, as I said, we had land fragmentation with roads and industries, um, new buildings, people are moving into to the uh, to more urban areas and there are um, development and which is also a good thing uh, but you should um, you can do development in good ways and bad ways and some sometimes the the issues and the views from the Sami and the reindeers are not or are, are quite overlooked um, so on top of all of those things you also have the changed climate um, that you need to deal with, uh, which is very <laughs> challenging. You have, for because of the changed climate, we see a bi bi biodiversity loss. Uh, there is some species that are decreasing heavily because they cannot stand the the new climate. For example, the reindeer, it's it's developed to survive in Arctic climate. It has um, their hair is designed to isolate in a very smart way. Um, their feet are, are designed to, to, um, uh, to, over, to survive very extreme uh, cold. And they do not um, thrive in warmer climate. They have difficulties with, with warmer climate. Um, but we also see that kind of change in biodiversity in vegetation and in insects and in birds and in other area, uh, animals or in our surroundings. And with this changed climate, you also have invasive species, right? There come new vegetation and new animals and new birds that we have never seen. And they have to create a relationship with the already existing biodiversity, uh, which is something that never, they have never been forced to do before. And some take over and some, some do, do disappear from certain areas because of that. With new invasive species and within these new relationships established between them, uh, we have new diseases coming in 
the reindeers all of a sudden have all of these different diseases that I've never experienced before or that my elders haven't heard of or fully understand, um, which is very challenging. We've had the droughts in, in this summer. Um, for example, <laughs> we, uh, we've had a very, very challenging winter with a meter of snow and um, and the reindeers, a lot of reindeers and the moose, for example, died because of that. It was just too difficult and too energy demanding for them to to find food. So um, the herds declined heavily. Uh, and those uh, lucky ones who survived this hard winter came into a summer, uh, which started off quite good, but then became so hot, so the swamp dried up completely and the small rivers dried up. Um, so the weak reindeers, they had difficulty to find water. Um, and our elders have seen um, calves died because they, because of the drop, they did not find water. And that's uh, something that's never, I've, I've never heard of it and they have never heard of that before. Um, we have a change in seasons seasons that comes earlier or that does not show up then our people have eight seasons um so that says something about um the the diversity in these in these areas um we when you have changed seasons you also get changed behavior and that is from from plants from uh, vegetations from from uh, from animals they are stressed um you can see that they are, um, some are waking up early and some is waking up later. And then um, when some are hatching, their vegetation is not there that used to be, uh, which is stressful for, for those species that um, live off, off that kind of vegetation. Um, with this also comes the weather patterns uh, that are changing or new weather patterns or no patterns at all. Um, a lot of the elders says that the the, the weather is um, um, is stressed. It it's um, it seems to be a stressed weather, um, and you can also you can also feel that. Um, and when you have um, when you're living in the Arctic and are trying to survive in the Arctic, you are depending on knowing your weather patterns and to to predict the weather. And uh, one become quite good at it, but sometimes with this change in patterns, it's it's difficult, uh, which is a risk. It is a direct risk for you and for your family members and for the reindeers you love, um, which affects your mental health, of course. But it also comes with uh, with a lot of grief and um, when you have family members that are. Um, going through the ice in the in the springtime because it was not stable enough, even though all the signs looked or pointed at at a stable ice. Or you have family members or reindeers that are lost in avalanches uh, in areas that should not have avalanches or have never had it before or should be safe. Um, so we have those kind of uh, stressed uh, moments that we that we have to live with. Um, and that is a part of our everyday life. For example, I, I think you've all uh, seen this, this uh, global news about the, the grieving whale, the orca who, uh, who carried her dead calf for 17 days. Um, and it was quite extraordinary for me to see uh, that, that there were a lot of people that did not anticipate that animal grief, their losses. Um, it is known that whales and uh, these species are, are grieving losses of, of family members, but um, it was interesting to notice that an entire globe didn't really believe that animals have feelings or, or are grieving the loss um, in relation to, to the, the constant grief that comes with climate change and a changed climate for the Arctic and all of the planets. Um, and when you combine all of these, these stressors and the facts um, and the effects that we are seeing today, 
uh, and when you try to then adapt to it, it becomes quite challenging because all of these affects your food security. You have difficulties finding food, maintaining food, and the food is changing with new vegetation. But the effect is also that you have a loss in language um, and indigenous people's languages are maintaining a lot of lessons learned, a lot of stories, a lot of history. And when the landscape are changing, so is the language. For example, we have different places. Um, one city that's, um, that's built on a place where there used to be a lot of, um, of a certain type of, uh, of a bird, but now it's a huge mine on that place. Um, and there are no of the, those birds left in that area, but that's usually where you went when you wanted to hunt that bird because, because of the name, and you knew that because of the name, that that bird were, were to be found in that area, which is not anymore. And that is a cultural loss as well. Um, and you lose your, your, when you have all of these stressors, it's difficult to maintain your livelihood and you might uh, stop being a rain in the herder and, and find other work, uh, which is a cultural loss for, for their generations. Because a lot of uh, the knowledge are transmitted into in, in those areas where you are living that traditional life or uh, a life with the reindeer that, that are lost. Um, when you stop being out on the land, then you will have uh, a loss of the knowledge transmission. But you also get the conflicts of interest that when you have a lot of interest and a lot of people are struggling to survive and uh, there's a lot of work opportunities that comes with a mine, for example, uh, that faces the, uh, the interest of the, of the reindeers and the reindeer herders uh, that creates conflicts of interest and it increases the racism in the area uh, heavily when you have these kind of conflicts and especially economic con conflicts and the conflicts of who, who has the rights to these areas. Um, and that of course affects your health and your entire family health. And all of these things also affect your economy, your, um, your capability to adapt to all of these different stressors, um, which takes its toll. For example, when it comes to health and increasing conflict and and, um, and racism. This is my baby sister and uh, she has to deal with racism in school. And she has to also deal with the worry that she carries and the love, because, because of the love to the reindeer. Um, my baby sister, she is worried uh, when she knows we have a, a wolf, for example, in the herd. Uh, she worries for the reindeers and who will survive and will, her reindeer survive and her favorite reindeer that she usually takes home every winter, will that one survive? Um, she also worries every spring when you have uh, rain on snow events uh, and when it starts to rain in the middle of, of the springtime when it shouldn't. Um, our springtime, it's still snow on the ground, so it should not be raining at that time. It should be snowing. Um, and and that's when the reindeer calves are born. And if it's rain during those, those time or, or that night, um, the mother reindeer will have difficulties getting her calf um, dry. And she will, the calf will, will most probably die that, that night. And those are the things that my baby sister are worrying about. And that is effects from caused by climate change and the changed climate that we do see. Um, we are to move out of the fossil fuel area and we all have to do that. Um, and we all have to put pressure uh, on industry, on people, on society, on politicians to actually do what it takes. Because right now we are very far from getting anywhere close to um, an, an only 1.5 um, average uh, temperature rise uh, globally. We are more, a, we're going for about three degrees and in the Arctic that will be devastating. Um, 
And this is the solution. Wind power, for example, is a solution. Um, but where I'm from, the land that we have already, the rangers have already given so much, as you've heard, to the hydropower dam and to, to buildings and society and are barely maintaining uh, their lives with the climate change. Um, and right now in Sweden, they are building these huge windmill parks on reindeer herding land um, where it's not most efficient. It's most efficient when you build the, uh, the windmill parks um, at the coast or close to the industries and cities that demands it because you lose so much energy uh, in the transportation. Um, this is another stressor, stressor for communities. This is a reindeer herding community and they have this huge windmill park on their land. Um, they have been fighting this off in court, not giving the legal advice or legal representation that, um, that, is, that gives them a fair fight really against these huge companies that want to make money. Um, they have represented, them, they have represented themselves in court. And they are not lawyers, they are reindeer herders, uh, which put them not in a very good um, position to win in the courts. But they have won some cases and they are still struggling and continue uh, to fight for the reindeer's land. And it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be something that we have to deal with, uh, with all of the other things that we are trying to survive and the reindeers trying to survive. Um, the demand that the world has on energy and to consume and to to what they call develop and um, the demand that cities have should not be paid by the the samis and the reindeers alone we should all share that share that lost and it is known that those there are all over these kind of things are happening indigenous peoples are standing up against government and against big uh, industries to save the land and to safeguard the land. And many of them are women. Many of them are young people. Uh, and many, the majority of those who are killed because of their being environmental activists are indigenous peoples. I have one of the solutions that I think is, is easy for understanding, it's not, we cannot have just one solution to all of this complex um, problem. We have to look at it on, in a holistic way. And I think it's best explained in a way that's called climate justice. And climate justice is the foundation of human and indigenous people's rights, that all of the actions that you do take have to have have to respect humans and indigenous peoples right then it will be come a, a good result out of it um, we all have the right to development but the development definition today i think is a bit wrong um, it has so much focus on on economy and making money right there and then but not a, in a sustainable way and in not in a way that you can recycle and reuse uh, and that should be the true challenge in development. And that is something that we all should be having as a goal. And we all have to do this, these actions with a focus on gender equality and equity. As I said, right now, those who are standing up are uh, people that are challenged by other um, vulnerability systems, those who are indigenous peoples without power, a woman that are without power in many areas they are the ones at the forefront and they are the ones that are challenging and they are paying a huge cost we have to do all of these action when we are dealing with the climate and the change climate we have to do that on the basis of equality and equity um, and that should be a standing component in everything um, and all the benefits that we are ga gaining from it it should be shared we have one globe, we are one ecosystem, and that ecosystem and the benefits should be shared amongst us as a society and as an ecosystem. We shouldn't have people on the top that are uh, have the, having the most money or having the most land or having the most power. We need to have a system change 
and we need to have a goal of sharing when we create that system change. In order to, to tackle climate justice, we also, uh, we also have to review our consumption needs um, and how we consume, what we consume and when. Um, we have to change that. We can consume, but then you also have to find, figure out ways of recycling, of making um, industries and the um, things that we use in our everyday life to be uh, less demanding of electricity, for example. Our demanding and the needs that we have for, our demand, for that kind of um, consuming needs so that, that needs to be changed. Um, and all actions that we take um, in climate change, in the climate change battle, it needs to be participatory. Everyone has knowledge and experience and we need to share that. We need to, um, to take the decisions of actions based on best available science and on best available knowledge. It has to be accountable. It has to be open and transparent. And um, it has to be just. And I think that if we tackle it in this way, I think we will have at least um, we'll have a chance at it. Um, and that is all I, I, I have to say, or I have to, to share with you as now. I hope that um, you have gotten somewhat more insight of the social impacts of the changed climate for the Sami, for the Arctic and the biodiversity, um, and gotten a bit of um, um, a holistic view of it. And I hope that you will be able to share it. Um, in in your daily life and in your work and in your future and i thank you all very much for this time um, we now have 20 minutes so i hope that you have some questions and i hope that i will be able to to answer your questions well thank you very very much yanni this was really very uh insightful and i think a lot of perspectives that maybe people had possibly stumbled across, but then also are not always so present, you know, because even uh, you mentioned the, the problem of the uh, impact of having uh, the, the lakes, the, the artificial lakes, the storage, the dams in, in the north. And of course, uh, these are also, you know, as you mentioned, uh, the backbone for some of the renewable energy build up uh, and and uh, of course there's quite a few people in the more southern regions of europe compared to your position uh, which includes germany where people think about using this uh, northern uh, hydro storage as basically a full backup battery for the energy system in the south and of course it's always what happens very far away, uh, people don't think much about any negative impacts. It happens out of sight. It's uh, very um, abstract in that sense. And I actually had this discussion on other, uh, other regions and other impacts where people brought up then this term of energy responsibility, basically as a counter argument to energy security. Uh, energy responsibility, meaning uh, also taking on some of the burden, the impact. There is no energy generation without impact, uh, taking on some of that at home. Uh, I found that extremely interesting. I just focused on this one part here, and um, I wanted to see if there is uh, is there some form of dialogue uh, happening between um, energy renewable energy proponents and the Sami Council, uh, be it at the national level or at the transnational level? Mm -hmm. um, thank you for, for that uh, reflection and that question. Um, indeed, we are, we are in, in a situation that, uh, of course, energy is important and we are also using energy I also have a house that have have light and such thing, and I'm I'm enjoying it. 
um, but I'm also still paying uh, more of a price than, than many others. Um, today, when we have this windmill um, explosion and people want to build it, it's very, very good. And it's really something we need. Uh, but for example, that, uh, the, as I said, they have been um, studies of where it's the most efficient place of putting these windmills, and it is by the coast in Sweden. But people that live by the coast, they think they are ugly, so they, they don't want to have them there. So then, therefore, they are placed in, um, they are trying to place them in our areas. Uh, and it is not, um, it is not a situation today where industries are coming in and asking us for permission to, to place windmills in our areas. We always have to go to court to fight for our land or for the reindeer's land. Um, we have had one, the, the small community that I showed um, on my screen, they have fought off this last year eight different companies on their small wind on their small areas they already have windmills on it and they have lost they won five cases but it's still a lot of um, cases that they have to address and a lot of uh, court time they have to spend whereas they also are as i said reindeer herders they have to be out with the reindeers every day and to make that life um and, and to make that out while they're also spending a lot of time in court and and writing a lot of document and yeah so today it's unfortunate that it is uh, we always have to go to court to fight fight off uh, the industry mm. well th thank you that's um of course i would say there's potential for for improvement there maybe as a positive um uh, response and and I want to also give the opportunity to our participants to ask questions. And I think Diane was the first one to um, show interest in asking a question. <coughs> Diane, I have unmuted you. Oh, thank you so much. Um, that was such a powerful and interesting presentation. And I hope you don't mind if I call on you in the future to ask you some questions related to the research that I'm doing. But today, I just have two quick questions. The first is, how many Sami people are there? And the second question is, I've read that the Sami Council is trying to promote sort of one Sami or a united Sami people. And I wonder if you might explain what that means, or you might talk about those efforts. Thank you, Diane, for those uh, very kind words. Um, and of course, it's um, it's you are you are well all very welcome to reach out to me. You have my uh, my email, um, so please do. Um, in in relation to your first question of how many Sami people there are, um, it is not known. Since we had the World War II and the, the racism and ethnicity issue that came from that, it's illegal for in Sweden to count uh, people by ethnicity and to keep reg registers of it. Um, they, they do unfortunately exist, um, those kind of registers, but it is not um, allowed. Um, and to that question too, it is, it's, we don't know how many we are actually. Um, I am white. Also, we are an indigenous peoples that are that are white, uh, which is quite rare. But it also makes it very easy for us to hide in the majority. Um, if you have a trained eye, I you could probably spot out who is Sami and who's not. And you mostly notice it um, in the way that our culture is and how we, our worldview and how we speak and how we act. So that's when when you notice who's who. Um, but today we, and also because it was um, after the World War II, it was not um, very, it was not a very high in hierarchy <laughs> to be a Sami. So a lot of uh, Sami went into hiding and it's not, it's just now uh, that the third generation is uh, realizing that they are Sami, um, but they never knew that. And then uh, the Sami council, we are, we are the Sami people, we are one people. 
And we created the Sami Council in 56 because we wanted to address all of these issues as one people. And that's something that um, we, we, all, we all know and we all say, but after, uh, well, the borders of states have divided us into what they think are the Nor Norwegian Sami or the, the Swedish Sami or the Finnish Sami or whatever. And they also forced us to, uh, to take on different languages, um, even though our languages are cross borders. Um, and they also forced us to, to have different Sami parliaments. So you have one parliament in Sweden and in, one in Norway and one in Finland and none in Russia. Um, and they all are all addressed uh, to their uh, respectively um, state and to their parliament. So what, what the Sami Council wants to do is to have one Sami parliament that are speaking for Sami issues and not uh, separate as the states have have one or have done to us or have wanted us to be. Great. Uh, we have another question. This one coming from Tuli. Uh, you're unmuted and you can ask your question now. Or Hello. Not. So now, now I can hear you. So back for the presentation. Thank you for your presentation. <laughs> it was nice to hear this presentation from, from the neighboring country. I live myself uh, in Rovaniemi. Um, it, um, I have heard quite many presentations uh, concerning Sami issues, but this uh, you mentioned uh, about the ethnicity and that you can, cannot count uh, how many Sami people there really are. So it was something really new to me. I have never heard that. And I would even say that please point it out in the future because it's something we don't know in Finland, for example. It, it, nobody has ever ever mentioned that. Uh, and um, there, there were some other points. So um, I'm writing myself my uh, master's thesis concerning the Arctic Council and I have read that um, the role of the permanent participants is to kind of um, raise the awareness of, of cultural and social impacts. Um, so um, I, have, uh, I have seen a word like persuasive, persuasive capacity. So do you think that um, so-called social or cultural issues have um, have a role in in the Arctic Council or um, how can I describe it or explain it? Is it is it uh, only in a minor role in the Arctic Council or um, is it kind of built inside the Arctic Council? Is the role good enough for those social issues? Okay, um, thank you, Tuli, for, for your question and uh, thank you for, uh, for speaking in, in my language as well. Um, it's, a, it's very interesting that you want to, to write your master's about the Arctic Council and uh, as I believe you are aware, Arctic Council is a huge machine um, and the permanent participant, with, which is the indigenous peoples organizations, uh, we have a part in each and every one of those small machineries in the Arctic Council. Um, and I, I don't think I would, I would describe it as our role is to raise awareness of, of cultural impacts. Um, our role is to be partners with the states in all of these issues that the, the Arctic Council are addressing. Um, we have um, six big working groups. Uh, as I said, I'm working within a working group that's doing with monitoring and assessments. Um, and we do different monitoring. Um, and one of those relates back to, to or one of the, the latest one relates back to social and cultural issues, which is uh, uh, an adaptation report or assessment um, that, that touches and have to touch upon those issues and have to address issues more holistically and then you cannot do that without going into social and cultural issues. Um, another example in the Arctic Council in the group that I've been working in is the resilience uh, work that they have done 
And resilient is when you have a system that um, is completely collapsing, but you have you are surviving, uh, but you are doing that in another form. You have to take another shape. Um, and that resilience, you, to you cannot create resilience. Resilience is something that happens. Yanni, I'm not sure if you ended your sentence there or if you broke up. Um, I hope you're still here. I know you said that you would um, have to leave after the first hour, but technically we still have uh, five minutes. So I wanted to give, provided you're still here and you can still hear us and uh, speak. Can you guys? Yeah. I saw that your lips were moving, but I couldn't hear anything. Okay, okay. Um, so I couldn't hear you either, so uh, oh. we're, we're even on that. I was okay. just uh, saying I couldn't hear you at the end of your response, but I was hoping we can, um, if, if, you, if you have given your response, that we can maybe get, get another question in uh, if, if you have five more minutes. Oh, uh, yeah, of course. Um, and my final response and ending of that response would be that uh, Arctic Council is doing good work on social cultural issues, but can do a lot more as well. Great. So now is the question coming from Dario. Um, Dario, I've unmuted you. Yes. Can you can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Good. Good evening. Uh, good evening. And I'm, uh, I'm calling in from from Sweden actually. So uh, we are kind of close. And uh, thank you so much for your presentation. It was brilliant, heartfelt, informative. I really, I really enjoyed it. And I, so I want to thank you for that. And my question is, so, um, so Sami people are recognized minority uh, in Sweden. And I, but I feel that when, when narratives about Sami people and indigenous people for this matter, come, come into, into sort of Swedish politics or talks about, you know, Swedish societies, they always perceived as sort of activism when i when i i didn't know anything about indigenous people before i started my master thesis research and then i got informed about them and 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 now that i talk about my swedish friends about the issues of indigenous people of semi people i always feel that you know this is like activism for them like in semi issues are perceived as confined into the activism sort of uh area whereas you know they are part of the society or part of the swedish country so I'm wondering uh, how 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 can I or can we as known indigenous people help facilitate the conversation and help semi issues flow into the narrative in a way that is not op opposite or positive, uh, but it's sort of like collaborative. If you know what I mean. Um, yeah. yeah, I think I, I think I do. I I hope I, I understood it. Thank you, Daria, for for that question, and I think that you have made a very very good observation and unfortunately a very it's a real one as well um, the Samis are are one of um, is an indigenous peoples and are recognized for being that by the Swedish state um, but the Swedish state have for example not ratified um, the declaration of indigenous people's rights or ILO convention 169 dealing with indigenous people's rights um, and Sweden is doing a very poor job at uh, fulfilling any of those declarations or obligations they do have towards an indigenous people. Um, and you can see that in the society. And unfortunately, it's creating, I think the, the, the core is that people do not have knowledge of us or they don't understand us. And, um, and that is because they are not taught about us in school, for example. Um, there are a lot of children today that are not taught about the Samis or know our history. And that creates racism and it kind of fuels stereotypes as well. So that is an issue that we are dealing with and we're trying to change. Uh, and what you can do is to, to learn a lot about the Samis and to educate your people and your friends um, and to have um, courage in taking discussions that are not comfortable, uh, but maybe needs to be addressed if we are supposed to, or if we will 
ever overcome this racism that are in in the Swedish and Scandinavian societies. Mm. Back. Back. Now I can't hear you again. Sorry. Um, so thank you for this um, very very interesting presentation. We are at the end of our first hour already, Yanni. I know that Andreas had one question to ask. I think it's a yes and no question. So Andreas, if you want to ask it real quick, and Yanni, you answer it real quick, and I hope that Alexei is um, forgiving us for intruding into his hour. Well, thank you very much, Yanni, for the presentation. The question was written up in uh, the, the chat box that we have as organizers and panelists. Um, so you've seen it for a while, but it was written before um, the last uh, discussion. It's really about the role of the indigenous peoples of the North in the Arctic Council, which you described is very important. Uh, but, you know, many of the um, Arctic Summer College fellows, they come from countries that are south of the polar circle um, and the countries want to join the Arctic Council in some way. And the question is, given that prospect of more countries joining the Arctic Council, do you not feel the danger of being crowded out there? Um, I, I come from the view, the view that uh, the more the merrier. Um, we are we we have one ecosystem on the globe and we're all connected uh, and all the actions that are happening in China will affect the Arctic and it does and we know that so in order to combat all of these and or, and to overcome all of these uh, challenges we need to uh, we need to work as one and then all need to be at the table including us but of course there is a risk of the majority uh, being listened to more than the min minority. Um, but as long as the Arctic Council has a consensus system, um, I think uh, we could still, we will still have the potential of, view of viewing our, our standing points and where we come from and our voices. Great, excellent. So we got all the questions in. Um, Yanni, I want to say thank you. See you later this year. Uh, and uh, have a great evening and uh, really, really can't hear the applause now, but uh, we, we were all very interested in the presentation. Uh, you're more than welcome to stay on a few more minutes if you have time, but if you have to go, we'll be in touch soon again. So um, I want to already turn over to our next presenter. Uh, Alexei Tsikarev, uh, member of the United Nations Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, he started as a, as a member of the youth organization uh, Nori Kayala. I hope I said that somewhat yeah. right. Young Karelia um, was uh, heading the International Youth Association of Finno Ugric Peoples and also. Um, later um, became a member much later of the Indigenous Peoples Council under the head of the Republic of Karelia. And uh, Alexei's interests include Indigenous international affairs, Indigenous rights, youth policies, media, and the environment. And I'm very glad to have you back here in our uh, Arctic Summer College and um, to, to hear your presentation. I hope your screen sharing works already and uh, we'll just yield this floor over to you. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, Marx, thank you very much for inviting me again uh, to, to speak at the Arctic Summer College webinars. It's, uh, it's a pleasure for me, an honor uh, to be one of the speakers, panelists um, during last year's. Um, so, and now I would like to uh, to, I hope my slides are already uh, on the screen. Yes, they are. They are very good. So, uh, so this is not the first slide. So I have to go back. So I have many slides, but um, I will not show necessarily all of them. But uh, I will focus on some um, issues related to the work of the United Nations 
uh, in the field of indigenous peoples' rights uh, as human rights. And then uh, I can uh, showcase some regional examples uh, on how this uh, human, human rights, indigenous peoples' human rights uh, apply in, uh, in particular in some Arctic territories and how it is uh, uh, reflected in, in the studies and, and the work of the United Nations indigenous specific mechanisms. So um, I, I'm here in, in two capacities somehow, uh, first of all, as the United Nations expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples member. And secondly, I'm also a chair of, of a regional organization in, in my Republic, in the Republic of Karelia which is called Center for Support of Indigenous Peoples and Civic Diplomacy, Jan Karelia. So we have also some relevant information on, on the website of this organization. Uh, I, I would start with um, uh, listing some very important uh, international human rights instruments uh, which apply uh, to indigenous peoples' rights. For instance, um, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which uh, 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 70th anniversary uh, we celebrate this year. Um, there are also many international treaties, uh, such as the International Covenant on uh, Civil and Political Rights, the Covenant on the Economic Cultural Rights, uh, and um, uh, all these instruments. Of course, they um, they don't they don't necessarily mention indigenous peoples as a target group but but they uh, of course they concern uh, and they, they embrace indigenous peoples rights as well but there were also specific instruments um, uh, which have been created to support indigenous peoples and to promote indigenous peoples rights uh, and um, the the only so far legally binding instrument is uh, convention 169 of, of uh, the International Labor Office, ILO 169, um, and uh, we have so-called uh, uh, we have UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is uh, a not binding instrument right now, but uh, uh, it's um, uh, states states say that this is a soft soft power uh, soft law uh, instrument, but uh, many indigenous peoples and many experts as well think that really the declaration is also a legally binding uh, instrument for states because uh, this is a consensus document and um, states reaffirmed uh, lastly in 2014 uh, at the world conference on indigenous peoples all states all of them so they affirm reaffirmed the commitment to uh, uh, to implement the un declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples there are also some other instruments which uh, are important for indigenous people, such as the World Cultural Heritage Convention, uh, Convention on Biological Diversity. And uh, right now in the World International Property Organization, WIPO, there are discussions, quite long discussions on a possibility to create a legally binding treaty, uh, which also uh, would support indigenous people's rights uh, uh, to uh, uh, to preserve uh, the traditional knowledge, which is very important for the Arctic indigenous peoples uh, as well. And in the United Nations system, we have um, uh, three major specific uh, indigenous specific mechanisms, which are the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, uh, the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and the Expert Mechanism. On, on the rights of indigenous peoples. So the forum discusses uh, discusses um, different issues which uh, in regard with indigenous peoples, uh, and uh, the forum advises somehow uh, the economic and social council of the United Nations. So mainly economic and social issues, development issues, sustainable development goals, and uh, coordination between different UN UN agencies belong to the uh, to the duties of, of the permanent forum the special rapporteur uh, on the contrary is um, investigating country-specific situations 
uh, the special rapporteur can go to uh, for a country visit uh, and ask questions and collect information and then uh, make conclusions and observations and put forward recommendations for uh, states and then after some years can also undertake uh, uh, additional missions to to the same country in order to uh, uh, to to see how uh, recommendations have been uh, used by the state uh, and the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples where i'm sitting in for for the russian federation uh, eastern europe uh, and um, central asia region uh, so it is um, a seven members body uh, and um, we have seven members from the seven social cultural regions of the UN. Uh, also, I'm sorry. Uh, so these are some names here uh, of, of the members and um, uh, for, for the Arctic region, for example, we have uh, Laila Susanne Vars from Norway. Uh, she is working also for uh, National Human Rights Institution, which is um, uh, Galdu Center in Norway. And our mechanism, uh, UN mechanism um, uh, on the rights of indigenous peoples, uh, its main uh, main duty is to produce thematic studies uh, for the Human Rights Council. The Human Rights Council. Uh, so request summary to, to do these studies and advice uh, on indigenous people's rights. But recently, I mean, so far, so far we have produced uh, uh, almost 10 studies, uh, including on the right to education, the right to participate in decision making, languages, access to justice, cultural heritage, health, uh, on businesses and access to financial services. And uh, most recently, we, we we have done the study on free prior and informed consent. And uh, we have already started to do another study on, on migration and borders. And I think all of these studies are very uh, and very relevant to indigenous peoples in the Arctic. Uh, for instance, if we go back in time, uh, 2014, the study on disaster risk reduction, uh, we, we looked very carefully on uh, what is happening, for example, in 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 the uh, in the Arctic uh, as a consequence of of uh, the climate change? And there are a lot of a uh, lot of movements like uh, displacements uh, of, of 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 entire villages, uh, some problem with feeding reindeers uh, because of the uh, melting uh, melting of snow and so on. Uh, so this this is a, a, a study which which is not only uh, looking at the problem but also we were trying to to somehow integrate indigenous people's knowledge uh, how indigenous people's knowledge can be used uh, for the for for being more prepared uh, for for disasters and for uh, for integrating indigenous knowledge in in um, uh, preparing some actions against uh, the consequences of uh, or uh, uh, against the consequences of, of, of the climate change. Uh, also, um, the the study on cultural heritage, for example, we uh, we did some some follow up on on that uh, on that study last year in the University of Helsinki uh, at Indigenous Studies. Uh, so it was a conference uh, in November last year, so which was devoted to the uh, cultural heritage, and we um, we were trying to uh, to look at the uh, at, at at some um, international uh, documents like UNESCO Convention on the World Heritage and in, uh, Indigenous Peoples' concerns uh, uh, because Indigenous peoples are not happy with how this convention has been uh, managed. Indigenous peoples are somehow isolated from the participation uh, in decision making in terms of uh, um, taking new uh, new indigenous uh, heritage sites 
uh, as part of this convention and um, uh, there are a lot of questions how how actually UNESCO could could do more uh, in terms of integrating involving indigenous peoples in the cultural heritage process so we can we can uh, um, uh, also look at, at other studies uh, a little bit uh, later uh, during this presentation so I would like also to share the new the newest elements uh, on of, of the mandate of the expert mechanism because uh, in 2016 the Human Rights Council decided to uh, to uh, amend our mandate with with some new uh, very innovative elements. Uh, it was actually a, a demand from uh, from indigenous peoples because indigenous peoples um, while preparing uh, for the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples in 2014 uh, requested the, the the UN to create a monitoring uh, monitoring body uh, in the in the UN so that the the body could um, could observe how the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is being implemented. But the states, of course, uh, have been very reluctant to the idea of having a monitoring body because they insist that this is not a legally binding instrument and there should not be any uh, monitoring uh, body. But uh, states agreed to, uh, to reconsider uh, the mandate of the expert mechanism so several elements uh, proposed by indigenous peoples could be included. For example, uh, one of these elements is uh, to assist uh, uh, to assist member states and indigenous peoples upon request um, uh, to uh, in form of technical advice uh, regarding some domestic uh, domestic processes like drafting of laws uh, or policies. Uh, and so on. And uh, this country engagement element of the UN of the of the mechanisms mandate is um, is emerging because we we still don't have a lot of practice on how this country engagement can be done. Uh, we have done only two uh, missions so far, uh, one to Mexico, one to Finland. Uh, but this is very interesting how actually. Uh, uh, by request of indigenous peoples and in some cases even by indigenous peoples and states uh, we can we can produce uh, very technical advice to, su to, to support some domestic processes uh, we can also uh, uh, support member states um, uh, and advise them uh, how to implement recommendations made in in the different treaty body processes and universal periodic review processes uh, in the Human Rights Council. Uh, another mandated element is also facilitation of dialogue. So we are now mandated to uh, to assist uh, member states, indigenous peoples, and also the private sector uh, uh, to improve dialogue. And uh, our mechanism is also um, working very closely with the national human rights institutions, special procedures, and academia. So we um, uh, we undertake uh, s uh, different um, uh, intersessional activities, like intersessional meetings. We've done in Canada twice, in Russia, in the Hantimansisk Autonomous Region. Uh, last year we went to uh, Santiago de Chile and met with the, uh, with the president of Chile at that time, uh, Madame Bachelet. As you may know, Madame Bachelet um, uh, was recently elected uh, as, as the new high commission, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. So very important people for our activities as well right now. And uh, we recently, five, five weeks ago, we concluded with the 11th session of, of the expert mechanism. Um, and um, I would like to share that uh, which were our uh, main uh, priorities uh, today. It's uh, free prior and informed consent. It's reconciliation, 
recognition and repat uh, reparation, uh, dialogue with national human rights institutions, and uh, indigenous languages, because uh, 2019, uh, next year, uh, is proclaimed uh, International Year of Indigenous Languages. So actually, um, uh, this uh, free pride informed consent um, is a very uh, complex issue and uh, very important for, for the Arctic. Um, so what, what does it mean? Because among experts, uh, there are some, uh, there are different, different opinions, different points of views. Uh, what, what epic can be? Is it a right? Is it a norm? Is it a principle or standard? Uh, some people who came to the session this year also proposed that uh, uh, free prior and informed consent should should not go should should be uh, uh, one of the main principles of the international law, uh, same scale principles as uh, uh, territorial integrity of states, uh, uh, principle of um, uh, self determination, and so on. And some people propose that epic should be also one of those founding principles of the uh, international uh, international structure. Uh, but um, uh, of course, uh, uh, of course, there are other opinions. Uh, some people think that FPIC should be a process. Uh, FPIC um, uh, is uh, is only uh, possible. Uh, uh, in, in the situations when indigenous peoples have been consulted uh, at all stages, from the beginning of a particular project to the very end, and indigenous peoples have also a, a right to, to say no in the middle uh, and withdraw uh, the consent in cases when, um, when for instance, um, uh, some promises were uh, violated or something uh, went in the wrong direction in, in the project, which was negotiated. Um, uh, I also wanted to say that um, we, we have, for example, such a, uh, uh, we have an opinion from uh, coming from the new chair of the International uh, Inuit Circumpolar Council, uh, Deli Sambadoro. Uh, is a former chair of the permanent forum on indigenous issues and very very well known expert in uh, in the arctic and beyond and for example Delhi says that um, uh, the free pride informed consent is not only a principle but it is a right uh, and this is a right which includes a, vet a right to veto uh, because uh, ethic is part of the participation in decision making and the participation in decision making is uh, is part of the right to self determination so there are so i, I mean uh, despite the fact that um, the study of mrip on fpic is already uh, finalized and will be presented to the human rights council next month but uh, we don't say that this is a, a final say because the fpic practice is is always being uh, developed. It is developing all the time, and um, this is just a status report on what are what are different points of views uh, on on this problem. And there are, of course, in the Arctic, um, different uh, approaches. I, I would like to share one of them uh, coming from from the Russian Federation. So uh, this is a so-called ethnological impact assessment or socio-cultural impact assessment. Uh, we have um, only one region uh, in Russia. It's uh, the biggest Russian region, Republic of Saha Yakutia, uh, where this uh, in ethnological impact assessment is already uh, incorporated in the regional legislation. So there is a law um, uh, demanding uh, from the demanding companies uh, and whoever works on, on the land of indigenous peoples to uh, to actually uh, uh, to, to do ethnological impact assessment. Uh, but the problem is that um, uh, because of the absence of, of uh, analogous in the federal legislation, 
some companies could avoid this procedure in 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 the republic of of saha and um it means that um uh, so the law ex while the law the law exists it still doesn't work uh, properly and doesn't uh, reflect all the uh, uh demands of indigenous peoples uh, there are also many uh, because the federal analogous of this law is is being discussed right now and um, there are some uh, some questions who can represent indigenous peoples in the process uh, and uh, how actually uh, it, it can be uh, can be done in a way so indigenous peoples participate fully in the in the ethnological impact assessment uh, another example from the Russian Far East is uh, National Park Bikin, uh, which is um, uh, is um, uh, established with the consultation and as a consequence of the con uh, of the consultation with indigenous peoples, and indigenous peoples are part of the management of this national park, so they can exercise the traditional occupations and activities within the territory of the park. And uh, this is one of the uh, good examples of, of how the national park could benefit indigenous peoples. But there are also uh, very bad examples from, for example, very known case in uh, Hantimansi Autonomous Region uh, with the national uh, park Numto, uh, where indigenous peoples' territories, um, particular reindeer herding, uh, herders' uh, areas uh, are have been taken away for the needs of, of um, uh, oil and gas companies. Another very um, uh, very important topic right uh, now is the International Year of Indigenous Languages. As I said, it is next year uh, and proclaimed by the General Assembly. Um, so this, um, uh, this is also a very important uh, year next next year because i mean um this is a chance for uh for the states and indigenous peoples to get together again and improve policies on languages um unesco will uh present a new atlas on on world languages and just right today they uh announced uh, a survey on official and non-official languages world's languages so member states and um, indigenous peoples institutions can uh, take part and contribute to the survey uh, and it is a degree it is agreed that indigenous peoples uh, fully participate in the process of preparation and implementation of the international year so there was a steering committee established and indigenous peoples from all regions are pre uh, pre uh, present um, uh, in in the in the steering committee and the main idea of of this year is to uh not to celebrate but to uh, put forward practical uh, practical guidelines and practical measures uh how to uh, to to support indigenous languages on the ground uh in communities to support language activists to support uh, uh small local organizations in their struggle to uh, preserve and uh, promote indigenous languages uh, and th this is not an easy easy task because uh, as we know indigenous languages should be uh, uh, all languages actually should be uh, presented in all these spheres uh, like education the media uh, cyberspace uh, families of course and uh, uh, and um, administration and public services uh, and if if uh, languages exclu are excluded or, or from one of those or all of those spheres uh, it is not possible to to preserve and um, the international year should uh, draw attention to all this um, like in in the in my republic in Karelia we somehow uh, we, we sometimes um, even need to to preserve a physical space for indigenous peoples to be able to exercise their linguistic rights, uh, like this uh, house of the Karelian language project. So people, local community people, they simply 
uh, wanted to to reconstruct um, one of the houses in the village to create such a place there where they could exercise uh, and uh, get together, um, create a language nest, uh, create a, a local language theater. Um, and uh, for example, we, we took this language nest method from Finland, uh, where it is uh, working for last years in Inari to support Inari Sami language. And uh, previously it was taken from New Zealand and Hawaii, uh, where it was uh, created actually in New Zealand as language nest methodology. So now it works on also in, in, the, uh, in the Karelian language house. And uh, just uh, very briefly would like to mention the, the new study, which the expert mechanism is going to do this year. Uh, it's migration and borders, and uh, it's a very important topic for Arctic as well, as uh, Jani said um, in her presentation earlier. Uh, for Sami people, for example, live in, in the four countries, in Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. Uh, my people, Karelian, is also living uh, in several uh, Russian regions in Finland, uh, and um, we have... Um, uh, Inuits who live in many states and um, it's so important that these um, different states or sometimes regions, I mean the uh, sub-national level territories within one state um, uh, could provide same indigenous peoples with same rights because otherwise there are very difficult situations when one indigenous peoples live in different parts of uh, of the border uh, have different rights different uh, concepts of how this right should be implemented and in these cases it's very hard to uh, to to speak about uh, unity equity equality and so on uh, and uh, when we deal with international uh, migration and border uh, situations we we can also uh, encounter such uh, very viola uh, violent situations uh, like we had recently in in the US Mexico border uh, and our mechanism even produced um, a, a, a statement uh, on on this particular situation on the Mexican American border uh, with detention of indigenous children uh, separation of them from from their parents and so on uh, and sometimes it is also a question about uh, about human rights defenders. So human rights defenders situation is uh, is very important for uh, for UN experts, and we uh, we keep an eye on on this situation because sometimes even our colleagues uh, experts uh, UN experts are uh, targeted by by uh, injustice and. Uh, uh, violent state policies, like very known recent case with the special rapporteur on the rights of indigenous peoples, Wiki Tauli Corpus, who was put in the Philippines in the list of terrorists, and uh, uh, not only her, but many other uh, indigenous human rights defenders in the Philippines. And another another very important issue is um, truth and reconciliation uh, movements. So. Of course, many of you probably know the Canadian um, very successful example of, of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, my good, uh, my, my former colleague, um, uh, Grand Chief Wilton Littlechild uh, of Canada was um, one of the commissioners in, in the commission. And um, I was really impressed by, by the work uh, they were done in five years. Um, inspecting all these cases, um, visiting villages, communities, uh, and making, putting forward uh, uh, calls for actions uh, on how to, uh, to, uh, to go away from the historical trauma with the residential schools and uh, uh, provide justice and uh, uh, 
measures for for the rights of indigenous peoples in Canada. And uh, it's very interesting that right now there are uh, truth and reconciliation movements also in, in the Nordic countries. Um, I took part in, in one meeting in Finland, in Inari, uh, last February, uh, when we when, when uh, the government of Finland and uh, the Sami parliament and uh, communities uh, discuss the possibility of, of um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Finland. And similar, similar is in Norway. Uh, I think the commission is already established and um, by the Parliament Act and uh, there will be, uh, in, uh, the, the commission will look at uh, uh, what had happened with the Sami, Sami rights uh, and uh, also Quen uh, people's rights, Quen as a national minority in, uh, in Norway. So this is the picture from, from Finland. Um, and very briefly, I'm coming to an end of my presentation. Um, I wanted to say something about the country engagement missions. Uh, of, of the expert mechanism. So now the expert mechanism can take, uh, can receive, uh, can receive uh, requests from states, indigenous peoples, uh, or both, um, for technical advice. Uh, there can be different different stories. Uh, just uh, from our uh, very small, very small experience, I can say. Um, uh, in Finland, for example, uh, in the case of Finland, the Finnish Sami Parliament and uh, the, the, the Sami Parliament in Finland requested the expert mechanism to to help um, in drafting um, the new Sami Parliament Act, uh, which the uh, special commission in, in uh, drafting commission in Finland is is doing this work and uh, they invited us to visit Finland. So we went to Inari, uh, we went to Helsinki, we um, met with officials, uh, community members, uh, ombudsman offices, um, so every possible uh, representative stakeholder, academia, uh, and even those who, who were not um, accepted by the Sami parliament of Finland uh, to vote in the election. The Sami Parliament election, um, and uh, the simply what what they asked us to do is provide advice on the two specific topics. The um, uh, just to, yeah, the, the definition, the Sami definition, and the duty to consult. So what does it mean, and how how the international law can be used uh, in in this drafting process? So. Uh, we, we did um, a technical advisory note um, to, to the both parties, to the government to the, uh, and to the Sami parliament in Finland. And this is public information, so you can find it easily uh, on the website of, of MRIP, of the expert mechanism, uh, this technical advisory note. And now, um, now the process is, is uh, going forward and uh, the parties are asking us to provide uh, a follow-up commentary uh, on the on the draft law because after we we did our first first advisory note, uh, they uh, got together and they took some some of our notes and they they did some more drafting and now it's a, it's a new document so they ask us to to provide more comments on it. So this is a picture from from uh, visiting the community, the, with, in particular with the president uh, of the Sami parliament in, uh, in Finland. Um, so, um, there can be also different, different outputs from, from missions. There can be legal technical uh, advice, uh, there can be facilitation of dialogue, and in, in the Finnish case it was both. Uh, because uh, we, we went also to the drafting committee's meeting and uh, uh, tried to you know, facilitate and to express our points of views. Uh, there can be also follow-up activities and, and potential follow-up country engagement missions. 
and of course there are a lot of challenges uh, uh, the lack of political will disclosure of information uh, politically charged environment because uh, you know uh, sometimes elections national elections uh, elections regional elections local elections can can um, influence uh, and uh, demand experts to rush uh, and uh, put pressure and there are some situations when parties can use um, uh, experts advice as uh, as a political tool in the internal uh, in, you know um, uh, internal wars uh, rather than to use experts advice as a advice uh, as a as an expert tool uh, and uh, finally I don't have importantly uh, time uh, to uh, to tell more but um, uh, another important request uh, is um, uh, we're dealing with the, with, the, with this request right now it's a massa cover uh, a reindeer head from Yaki people in the border of Mexico and the US, uh, which is right now in the Stockholm National Museum, Swedish National Museum in Stockholm. And um, the Yaki people is, uh, the Yaki people request, requests uh, this reindeer to, to be uh, uh, returned back to the community. And uh, if, if um, 10 years ago, when the dialogue started, uh, it was not a success uh, because the museum simply refused to uh, to participate in the dialogue. So now we have uh, some positive movements because there were some. So the parties uh, the parties agreed to to meet, and uh, the, there have been several meetings in New York. In uh, one field visit, so the museum people went to the Yaki people community and they discussed. And now they ask Emrib uh, to to come in, to come over to the dialogue and uh, to, uh, facilitate it, and also to to provide some commentary to the museums and international museum community uh, in order for them to to be able to handle uh, other cases of repatriation of indigenous people's cultural heritage, particularly those cultural items uh, which had been uh, Taken, taken away without free prior and informed consent of indigenous people. And there are lots, lots of cases. Uh, of course, we can use some existing documentation, existing instruments, but there can be a need for a new international treaty to support this movement. Yeah, and this next study, uh, we, so we, we try to look uh, uh, further and uh, one of the next studies will be on the right of indigenous peoples as a tool for conflict prevention, peace, peacemaking and security. So um, with this, uh, I would like to, to stop uh, in order to, to pick some questions. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, we'll be happy to, to answer or comment. Well, thank you very much, Alexei. That was very, uh, you know, similar, but very different and a very different angle, of course, and also uh, from a different location and uh, different, different focus in the presentation. I think what you showed above all was that indigenous rights, they're not necessarily limited or, or the challenges, they're not necessarily limited to one particular region in the world, but there's a lot of shared challenges where actually across regions, collaboration makes sense. And we talk about this so much in the Arctic Summer College, how even within the Arctic, very often uh, the national boundaries, they, they don't really matter because it's not about that, it's about having shared challenges and then also shared solutions hopefully uh, i thank you very much for making this clear point and also linking beyond the arctic and showing how these um, actually different movements and and different uh, historical or contemporary events all link to the same struggle uh, I'm, i find it highly impressive and 
and you seem to be fully immersed in that topic. I'm, I'm very excited that you stick to this and, and that you keep the work going and up. And I'm also excited that we have you in a session at the Arctic uh, Circle Assembly later this year in October in Iceland. So as always, we do still have 15 minutes. So what Alexei said is, yes, uh, you are most welcome to ask questions. I would assume that we can take at the very least three questions in, uh, depending how complicated they are, of course. And uh, you can feel free to ask anything. And I think um, if, if also I wanted to say, some of our organizers, including, of course, Andreas and Brendan, you cannot uh, use the tools. You know that you have to wave your hand separately. So Brendan is already here. If, Brendan, if you have a question, uh, I, I don't even have to unmute you. You can do that yourself. Yes, I, I have that agency. Thank you, Max. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Alexei, uh, thank you very much for the very informative presentation. I was really impressed with the breadth of topics that you're dealing with. Uh, and I will actually be uh, a member of the panel along with you uh, at the Arctic Circle Assembly in October. So I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of a continuation of the, that conversation. I uh, am very, I come from a little bit different background. I work with Max at Ecologic Institute, but I didn't study environmental sciences in school, but rather more cultural and, and literary backgrounds. And so I was, of course, very taken by your uh, investigation into repatriation of several artifacts, which of course is a very uh, important topic for identity of cultures, I think, uh, but also to uh, interrupt this process of appropriation that happens uh, across the globe in, in very interesting ways. But what I wanted to ask you is uh, a little bit outside of my my normal frame, but it's something that uh, uh, addresses a topic you brought up toward the beginning of your presentation, uh, which is something we discuss frequently in Arctic Summer College, which is the use of traditional knowledge or so-called traditional knowledge, um, because it's very current so, uh, as well. But the use of that in addressing international issues or efforts to combat climate change. And I've always found this a little bit, um, I hate to use the term, but disingenuous that uh, Western societies or practices uh, come to indigenous peoples in a time of emergency and say, oh no, what should we do now um, for a system like this? And as, as valuable as I find this, this information and, and the access to this knowledge, I wonder if it doesn't, um, if, if indigenous peoples aren't thinking, well, there are other forms of cultural, social, economic uh, knowledge that we have, not just uh, awareness of our environment and our land that might be of use and might be of service to the broader global community as well. Whereas traditional knowledge isn't just, you know, how do we take care of of the polar ice caps or anything like that, but how do we live as, as a community? And so it would be nice if you could talk about other forms of knowledge that you, know, you think could be particularly useful uh, in, in to the world. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for, for this uh, question. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, um, I, I was uh, lucky enough to participate in the in the 36th uh, session of the intergovernmental um, intergovernmental uh, committee uh, of of WIPO, it's a World uh, Intellectual Property Organization, it was um, uh, last June in Geneva, and uh, we had uh, pretty long discussions um, on on this um, traditional knowledge because. Uh, uh, in while negotiating the the new treaty on on the uh, uh, traditional knowledge uh, so states uh, in particular many western states they they really exploit this uh, western idea of, of of the traditional knowledge the property intellectual property uh, while indigenous peoples don't um, 
necessarily agree with the idea of intellectual property. So for them, it's traditional knowledge, not intellectual property. Uh, but indigenous people somehow had to accept this, these terms because otherwise they could not even participate in this uh, very um, uh, complex discussion and uh, uh, discussion which is run by lawyers. Uh, and indigenous peoples are a very small group in that. Uh, the indigenous caucus in, in, in WIPO is almost you know, six, ten people uh, who, who have been participating for last 10 years and uh, there is no idea uh, when this treaty can be finally uh, negotiated. Uh, but the, the session which um, uh, I was present on at uh, uh, was devoted to the databases uh, because uh, uh, databases uh, have been considered as an additional tool um, how to preserve uh, indigenous people's knowledge. The indigenous peoples, of course, uh, uh, so they, they can accept the idea of, of databases, uh, but uh, because there is a lot, of, a lot of knowledge which have been already uh, collected and stored and so on. And for this kind of knowledge, it, it, it's accepted. Uh, so there can be databases, but, uh, but if, if we speak about something new, new knowledge, um, so indigenous peoples are not necessarily in agreement of uh, taking this new knowledge into databases without uh, free prior and informed consent, at least. Uh, because otherwise, if, if we put also this new knowledge to the databases, we cannot uh, uh, somehow uh, preserve the indigenous people's rights to this knowledge and indigenous peoples. Um, uh, and um, we, we ca I mean, we cannot preserve this knowledge from misappropriation uh, and from from using, uh, misusing by by uh, by s different actors. Um, and when we spoke about traditional knowledge, of course, it's 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 also about climate change, but it's 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 not only it's it's also about uh, for example, the medical, um, the medicine, uh, uh, medical, um, you know, knowledge, uh, health-related knowledge, uh, herbs, how to use herbs in in the med traditional medicine. So these these are uh, in the WIPO process. These these are the main topics uh, which are related to the genetic resources, uh, genetic resources of the. Um, plants, uh, herbs, uh, uh, and uh, animals even. So it's, um, it's a huge, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, a, it's a huge topic. And uh, I think that indigenous, I, I think that um, this WIPO, WIPO process is, is very, very important, but somehow it's undermined by many actors, even by indigenous peoples, because if we see how many indigenous peoples participate in, in the permanent forum on indigenous issues, like thousands uh, annually. And they, they just go there to New York because they, they used to go, um, because they can meet everybody there, they can speak out. Um, and this is a good platform to advocate. Uh, but somehow uh, this kind of uh, processes like WIPO process, maybe they seem to be less important, but they are even more important than the permanent form, I think, because this is a treaty uh, which is being negotiated. No, I appreciate the, the answer, and this is something that, uh, reaching all the way back to Yanni's presentation uh, and her talk about self-determination, if we hadn't had so many questions at that time, I wanted to ask her a little bit about what does the idea of self mean or self-determination in a community that also talks about not leaving any traces you know she said that was a very important aspect you know not leaving any any residue if you will um as, as an individual but also as a community i suppose but this was something i was really hoping to get into and the same thing with this database or the archive or some way of preserving knowledge in a static form that then becomes no longer part of the oral tradition or or the you know the growing tradition uh, of, of these communities 
how that then uh, sort of counteracts or contradicts uh, this idea of not leaving these traces and not leaving, you know, of maintaining this ecosystem as a living, continuing thing. So it's, it's a conversation that I think is really important, like you said, and it becomes quite fascinating, especially when there's a treaty, an international treaty, so it comes up against these issues of governance. And uh, as soon as there's some sort of a treaty or or international governing structure, there's the opportunity for, I hate to say it, but a manipulation or, or uh, uh, it becomes almost a competition for control. And so balancing that, maintaining the, uh, the equity in that situation is so so essential. So thank you for your work. I mean, it's fascinating stuff. So I, I really do look forward to uh, talking to you more in, in October in Reykjavik. Yeah, with pleasure. Thank you. So um, just to follow up on this a little bit, it's uh, you, you mentioned, Alexei, you mentioned there um, also differences between or among the different um, indigenous groups. And I wanted to ask you personally, since you participate in these fora, um, what maybe surprised you the most? Because I imagine that you didn't know all of these indigenous groups before engaging in this forum. And like, what, what was, was something where you said, oh, I, I never thought of it that way or they really have a very different uh, worldview or, or culture compared to ours at home. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, I joined the, the movement in 2010. Uh, I came first to the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and uh, really uh, joined the, the Indigenous Youth Caucus as well. And uh, it was a, a, a huge um, experience for me because uh, in my communities, we we approach many issues very differently uh, than, than uh, other indigenous peoples, even even so close to us, like Arctic communities, because I really think that uh, Karelian people is, people is also part of the Arctic uh, region, and uh, we even uh, related people with Samis and, and many others, uh, and have a lot of similarities in, in the worldviews and, and um, traditions, expressions, and so on. But still, this idea of, for example, this idea of uh, truth and reconciliation is is very interesting because uh, it it hasn't applied uh, here in Karelia, uh, neither in uh, in any other Russia uh, Russian community indigenous community. So this is so important, I think, so important idea to accept and to uh, to uh, maybe to 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 lend uh, to borrow and to use here, but. Um, Maybe because of the political uh, differences, po the different political structures, uh, uh, political systems, um, and maybe the current political situation uh, is not supportive to uh, to this kind of idea of reconciliation um, here in Russia. But because this idea really demands, um, uh, 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 this idea requires to uh, to accept. Uh, that something had happened in a wrong way in the past, and if you don't accept this idea, you cannot, you know, reconcile and um, and and uh, establish a, a truth and reconciliation commission because there can be no, uh, I mean, there can be no truth without uh, accepting the past injustices, and there is no need for truth if you don't reconcile after afterwards. So, in in, um, in in this regard, I learned really much from from Chief Little Child uh, in, from Canada, from other colleagues, uh, um, and I'm still learning because uh, this mechanism is um, is so diverse in terms of uh, uh, different representatives. Um, uh, like we have uh, uh, one from Australia, Megan Davis, uh, Professor Davis, and we have Albert Barume from Congo, uh, and these are very di different situations. Like if we struggle here in in Karelia, in in Russia, mainly um, like such, let's say humanitarian issues like the languages, uh, cultures. So 
in other southern Asian communities, for example, there is a struggle for, for the right to life, uh, mostly. Uh, the right to land and uh, so the fundamental rights. Uh, but but there are rights, uh, there are problems which unite us a lot, like the right to health, for example. It Regardless of the wealthiness of, of states, uh, problems with the right to, to health are everywhere. In wealthy states, in uh, in developing countries, everywhere, same, same problems actually, with people living in the remote areas, uh, with people living with disabilities, um, with people um, uh, with with um, uh, you know mental health, uh, uh, health. I mean, um, uh, sexual health, reproductive rights, and so on. So these are very similar in every every country, every community. Well, that's, that's, that's good to hear the similarities and in, in shared um, challenges. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Alexei. Uh, we are already at the end of the hour. Uh, I, th I, I find it fascinating how there's never enough time, there's so much to explore, but as Brendan mentioned, we'll continue the conversation with you later in October this year. Uh, we'll also try to live stream this again. So even those of the participants or viewers who, who can't join us there in October, they can hopefully, if technology works, they can watch what's happening there. Uh, I, I don't want to say it's 100% sure, but we've managed before. And uh, Alexei, thank you so much for um, taking time in your evening hours to talk to us to present and uh, to all of you have a great rest of your day and uh, talk to you again next week at the same time it's the last arctic summer college session for 2018 next week so don't miss that one and uh, hope to hear from you and let's stay in touch thank you bye bye thank you very much